Now we ended up in last Thursday's lecture uh, getting to the spiders and pretty well through the spiders, uh, but there's some other arachnids that we need to talk about. Uh, we did cover the, the most important ones that everybody's worried about, the black widow spider and the brown recluse spider. Those are the ones that everybody's heard about are dangerous and, and so forth. There's a tremendous diversity of spiders that are out there. Uh, virtually all spiders, again, have spinnerets. All spiders make webs web, but that doesn't mean that all spiders make a web for trapping uh, insects. Uh, the one thing that, that all female spiders do is they put their eggs in a silk egg case, uh, but uh, those that don't make uh, nests or something often just use the silk maybe to line a chamber that they stay at uh, at night or a burrow or something like that. Uh, again, Spiders are feared. Uh, they, they've been favorites of, of uh, movies for many years. I've got some of, some of my favorite. I, I collect all those uh, old movies from the, the 40s, 50s, and 60s uh, in, in which they ha actually didn't have what we've got now where we can electronically insert a spider in, into a blue screen or a green screen. Uh, they had to use these goofy-looking rubber models and, and other things in there. It's, it, it's, uh, it's, it's really humorous to see it now, but uh, when I was your age, uh, they, they were really the cat's meow when it came to, to uh, studying these. The bottom line, uh, most spiders are, are virtually harmless uh, unless they feel threatened. They're not going to use their modified chelicerae, which have been modified into fangs, uh, to protect themselves. They're, let's, let's be brutally honest about this. You're a lot bigger than even the biggest spider. Uh, and, and they have evolved the, the habit of avoiding anything that's large and moving uh, because it might be something that, that would kill them, uh, either uh, prey on them as food or just kill them out of spite. Uh, some of these can, can be fairly impressive. Uh, we're getting a lot of uh, pictures coming in now to our diagnostic clinic, and, and I'm getting them uh, virtually every day. Uh, I see them posted on Facebook and so forth. What's this big golden spider out in, in my backyard? Uh, and it's just the garden argio. Uh, it's kind of an interesting one. If you go over to it, and, and uh, get close to it, it actually will probably drop out of the web and, and try to run and hide from you. Uh, usually when I approach him, I come in low and, and put my hands down and, and let them drop into my hands. Uh, and that usually upsets them even more. They, they go, oops, I dropped into something that's warm and I'm not sure about this, and they'll try to jump out of my hands, but I can usually cage them pretty well and, and uh, uh, show them to people. But, but again, as long as I don't pinch their legs or squeeze their abdomen, uh, they're not going to try to use their fangs to protect themselves. Now let's move in, into the next group of, of arachnids, uh, and these are called, often called daddy long legs. I'm not sure I like the, the name daddy long legs any longer because I went out to the west coast one time and started talking about daddy long legs and assumed everybody knew what I was talking about, and all of a sudden somebody said, you know, you know those daddy long legs are poisonous, and I said, oh no, they're not, they're harmless, they don't have any fangs, and he says, oh no, they're the ones that live down in my basement and they hang upside down, and I go, oh, you mean cellar spiders. Uh, and, and so on the West Coast, uh, they call lo daddy long legs these cellar spiders. And so we were talking about two different things uh, in there. And I've heard that the, the French uh, actually call crane flies. These are actual flies that have really long legs, daddy long legs. And, and so you've got to be careful sometimes with common names uh, of what you're dealing with. These are all in the, the order Opolones. Uh, and, and I generally use more the term harvestman uh, when I'm speaking about them in, in here because there's not many other things that are called harvestman. Uh, but I grew up knowing that they, they were daddy long legs, and, and so I often revert back to that. Most importantly, uh, oh, I want to point out to you, there are some short-legged daddy long legs. <laughs> So don't go by the, the, the length of the legs. If you see something with really long legs, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a daddy long leg. It may be a long-legged spider. Uh, and on the other hand, there might be a short-legged daddy long legs that you're looking at. What you really need to look at is the body. And what you'll see is that the cephalothorax and the abdomen are broadly joined. In other words, you don't see that little constriction uh, 
that we saw with the spiders between the cephalothorax and abdomen. So if you look at it, and, and it's got the, the eight legs or four pairs of legs, and you go, oh, that looks like an arachnid. I don't see any antennae on it. That's arachnid. But when you look at the body and it looks like it's just one structure, it, it will usually be egg-shaped or sort of football-shaped, uh, then you're looking at a, an opalones or a harvestman. Why is that important? They're all harmless. Uh, these still retain the chelate or pincher-like chelicery. And, and so they have chelate or pincher-like chelicery that, that they still have to rip and tear their food in order to get the liquids uh, out of it. And as you can see in this diagram, uh, they've got these little tiny sort of feeler-like or antennae-like pedipalps. And, and so these things that look like little fingers here or little antennae are the pedipalps. Remember, the chelicery and the pedipalps are the two feeding structures, the, the two mouth structures that these arachnids have. Now, uh, daddy long legs do have repugnatory glands. What's a repugnatory gland? Stink gland. So if you pick one up and squeeze it, they'll make your finger stink. But that's as far as it goes. Uh, now my feeling is is that uh, the, the smell that I get out of them makes them pretty unappetizing, so uh, the, it's probably just a defense to keep from being eaten. Uh, is, is why they've got them, but they're, they're absolutely harmless. They can freak people out. For some reason, we human beings seem to be alarmed. Uh, we, we seem to be annoyed and, and upset by things that have long legs for some reason, uh, except for basketball players. We want them to have long legs, but when we're talking about creepy crawly things, if they got lots of legs and long legs, it just sort of, sort of gives everybody the creeps. Uh, and the problem is, is that especially in the spring and the fall, when these things are reproducing, they can often build up populations that, that may be hundreds of them in one area. And that's pretty freaky. I remember seeing one of these. Uh, uh, my wife and I had rented a cabin for the weekend, uh, and all of a sudden I heard this shriek from my granddaughter, uh, and I run out, what's wrong, what's wrong? He says, look up there, granddad. And, and uh, there was like 50 of uh, these daddy long legs that were all clustered underneath the eave of the, the uh, back porch. Uh, and and uh, I said, ooh, cool, look, all those legs in there. I said, watch this. So I took a little branch and brushed them, and they all just started running and scattering. And, uh, and of course, uh, much to the, the horror of my granddaughter to that. Now, she's gotten over that now, uh, but it, it was uh, kind of fun at the time. Again, these are considered to be beneficial. Uh, we consider them uh, predators, but we're finding out now most of them appear to be scavengers. Uh, and that means that they feed on other insects and arthropods that were killed from some other means. Uh, they're, they're not very uh, 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 aggressive predators is another way to look at it. We're also talking about these, uh, they're, to me, the long legs, I've always asked, you know, why do they have these long legs? Uh, what uh, evolutionary value is that? And, and there was another publication a few years ago that came out where somebody had actually watched these eating ants. And so here you've got these little ants, and let's say I'm an ant, and I'm walking in my little ant trail down here. Uh, now, we're all female. I can't be the, the ant because uh, we're, we're, uh, ants are all females. Uh, but all of a sudden, the, you know, I'm following Susie in, uh, who's in front of me and all of my, my antennae. I don't see very well, but my antennae's touching Susie. We're all staying in a line. And all of a sudden, Susie disappears. What the heck happened? Alice is still behind me, but Susie disappeared. Well, this daddy long legs uses those sort of like a crane. And it can lower itself down, and what it did is it picked that ant up and raised back up and tore it apart and ate the, the goo out of it. And so, in essence, they're hiding from small animals by being on this giant crane-like structure that they can lower themselves and grab their prey, and their prey doesn't see them, uh, especially uh, something like an ant that, that really uh, basically just sees light and dark. Our next group is actually the largest group of the arachnids, and these are the mites and ticks. 
they're they're called uh, the acari. Uh, they're they're mites and ticks. How many legs are they going to have? They're going to have the four pairs of legs, or eight legs. Uh, and in this particular case, most mites are fairly small. They're usually uh, easily less than, than a half a centimeter uh, in length, uh, probably a quarter, uh, you know, an eighth of an inch or less is where most of the mites are going to be. But there are some larger mites, uh, and the larger mites are the ones that we often call ticks. Mites fit virtually all of the ecological areas. Uh, there, there are some that are detritivores. We talked about that in, in lab. That means they eat detritus and, and break down uh, bits and uh, pieces of organic matter into smaller bits and pieces and so forth so that where the bacteria can eventually break them down to the elemental uh, material. There are mites that are plant feeders. There are mites that are parasitic. Uh, and there are other mites that are what we just call free-living predators. And, and so, as you can see, they, they run the whole gamut. Uh, if you think about it, kind of like the nematodes. Uh, the nematodes run that whole gamut uh, of all the things that they can do uh, in, in nature. Again, in this case, what we find is, is that the chelicerae, uh, are generally chelate, meaning they have the little pinchers, but in some cases, like in ticks, they can be really, really tiny pinchers that, that they're almost in, into these little burrowing machines that, that chew a little hole in your skin until they find a blood vessel, and then they suck up the blood uh, that comes out of that. Uh, and, and so that's why we, we say that they're sort of variously modified. The pedipalps, in general, are sort of finger-like. Uh, and, and we think that, that both the chelicerae and pedipalps, uh, when we look at them under the microscope, they have a whole bunch of little sentry organs on the end of them. Uh, and we'll talk about this later on. They would be chemoreceptors. Now, what is your primary chemoreceptor? Your tongue. Yeah, so when I say chemoreception, we're talking about sensing chemicals. That means taste and, and smell. Uh, those, those are our chemoreceptors, uh, but these little sensory organs that are on the chelicerae and the pedipalps, and the other ones that we've talked about, the spiders and, and the daddy long legs or harvestmen, also have those structures uh, on there. They also have the cephalothorax and the abdomen broadly joined, and they've lost evidence of external segmentation on the abdomen. So the abdomen just looks like this bag uh, that, that's attached to the segmented cephalothorax. Here's, again, just some diagrams to sort of get us oriented uh, on these. We can see that the, uh, in the case of the little spider mite over there, which is a plant feeding mite, in this case, they, they retain the little pincher-like uh, chelicerae uh, and the, the sort of finger-like chemoreceptor pedipalps. And, and what they use those chelicerae for is to rip individual cells of a plant open, and then they suck out the plant juice contents uh, plant cells. That's why if you ever get spider mites on your plants, it looks like a whole bunch of little tiny yellow speckles all up and down the leaves, and that's because the chlorophyll and cell contents have been removed out of individual cells by those little tiny mites. Here's a tick, and, and again, we can see the, the cephalothorax is broadly joined uh, to the abdomen. In the abdomen, there's no evidence of segmentation. Of these, uh, the ticks are the ones that everybody worries about, but as far as I'm concerned, the mites are really more interesting and, and more diverse. Uh, when it comes to the ticks, we worry about them because ticks have a complicated life cycle. Most ticks go through three to four stages, as we would call them, and each stage has to take another blood meal. So most ticks hatch out into what we call a larval tick. That larval tick has to have a blood meal. Then it drops off of its host, sheds its exoskeleton, and now becomes a nymphal tick. And that nymphal tick has to find a host, feed on the blood again, drop off, shed its exoskeleton, and depending on the tick, it may have a second nymph or it may become the adult. Most of the ticks that we worry about are just three-stage ticks. Uh, so they have uh, the larva, the nymph, and the adult stage. Now, what's the problem of feeding three different times on three different hosts? 
boy, do you up the, open up the possibility of picking up a disease off of one host, and then when you feed again, you might transmit that disease. And, of course, we know that ticks do transmit diseases and, and some very important disease. We're, we're really worried in the state right now about Lyme disease from the American dog tick, I mean, from the, the black-legged tick, but we still have Rocky Mountain spotted fever and some other tick-borne diseases that are transmitted by some of the other ticks. On the other hand, uh, when we take a look at the rest of the mites, uh, there are some that are pestiferous plant feeders, primarily the spider mites. Uh, there are some that, that get in moldy and mildewy foods and, and cause problems. Uh, as I indicated to you, I'm going to France for the last two weeks of, of this month, and I'm actually going to be looking for a special cheese. The French have two kinds of cheeses. They have one cheese that's a really soft, gooey cheese that's filled with fly maggots. I just want to see it. I'm not sure I'm going to eat it. Okay. And then they have another cheese that's got mold on it and has these mites that, that help with the mold and, and stuff. And So for those of you that love that blue cheese and some of those other stinky feet cheeses, uh, watch out. There may be mites uh, in there and, and so forth. Didn't want to take you off your food, but uh, it's, it's the reality. Many of the mites, the ones that, that are also very important to us in agriculture, are valuable predatory mites and, and many of these predators feed on other mites and, and so I find it kind of interesting we just had a graduate student that, that graduated and, and she was actually releasing predatory mites on hops plants to feed on the plant feeding mites and control them and, and she found out that you could indeed control the, the hops plant feeding mites by using these predatory mites uh, we'll talk about that later on that, that's called using biological control. As I indicated to you before, uh, most people sort of glaze over when we talk about the mites, uh, but the, you'll wake up again when we talk about the ticks. Our two primary ticks that we have in Ohio is the American dog tick, that's the larger tick, uh, and the American dog tick is an open area tick. Uh, it prefers uh, grassland habitats uh, and, and sunny sites. Uh, you can find it along the edge of the woods, but you'll almost never find it in the woods itself. Now, most recently, uh, we've gotten this black-legged tick. Now, some people call it a deer tick, but there's another species of tick in the same genus that's the true deer tick. This is a different species. This one is a woodland tick. Uh, and also what's, uh, to me, interesting about the black-legged tick is that it's what we call a cool season tick. Most ticks... When it, the temperature gets below 50 degrees, they just kind of become quiescent or dormant and don't move around and, and just hang out until it warms up again. But this black-legged tick, uh, as soon as the temperature gets up to about 45 to 50 degrees, it's up and out. And so we've actually had to, to retrain a lot of the uh, hunters and, and fishermen, outdoor people uh, here in the state of Ohio because they used to think that, well, at Thanksgiving we've had a good freeze, I can go out and go hunting and, and so forth, not worry about ticks. Well, if you happen to have one of those nice uh, sunny days where it gets up to, to 55, 60 degrees, yeah, you can pick up black-legged ticks during that time. Now, what's important about these two ticks? Now, both of them can transmit diseases. The American dog tick is primarily responsible for transmitting Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And the black-legged tick is primarily responsible for transmitting Lyme disease. Uh, and and uh, it used to be when I first got to Ohio, I think we only had like three or four cases of Lyme disease uh, in, in Ohio. This was back in the, the late 80s, early 90s. However, over the last five years, We've had more Lyme disease cases in the state of Ohio than we have Rocky Mountain spotted fever uh, cases, and, and it used to be just the opposite uh, of that. The reason We're not sure the reason for this. Some people are blaming on, on global warming and, and so forth. My feeling is is, is probably habitat usage. Uh, we're, we're finding out that uh, this black-legged tick especially picks up the Lyme disease which is actually a endemic disease of small rodents. So mice, rats, 
uh, chipmunks, squirrels, things like that are the primary carriers of Lyme disease. And so when this tick is in its larval stage, it feeds on those small rodents, picks up the disease, and then when it feeds on a larger animal in the nymphal or adult stage, that's when it transmits the disease, okay? Uh, and it's the same thing with the, the American dog tick. Uh, the, the Rocky Mountain spotted fever is endemic in a, a fairly wide range of wild animals that are out there, uh, and, and so it can pick it up uh, as, as a uh, larva or, or a nymph and then transmit it in the next stage uh, if it feeds on another animal. Okay, most important things. How do you keep from getting any of those diseases? Got an idea? Well, the obvious thing is don't get bit. But that's not going to be the easiest thing to do. Uh, we, we suggest that you wear tight-fitting clothing, tuck your pant legs down in your boots, uh, wear long sleeve shirts and, and so forth, and, and most importantly, put on repellents of various sorts in order to keep those things off. DEET's probably the best one. Uh, I'm allergic to DEET. I've used it so much as a kid and a young adult uh, that, that I eventually became allergic to it. Uh, and, and so now I use Picardin. Uh, which is a, another type of repellent. The problem is where DEET would typically last uh, four or five, six hours, Picardin, you're lucky if you get an hour and a half out of it. Uh, so I always just carry a little bottle of it in my collecting bag and, and every hour or so spritz myself again uh, to, to keep them off. Here's another very important fact that you need to understand. If you go hiking, camping, working in areas that have ticks, do a tick check every eight to ten hours. We know that both of these ticks require a minimum of 24 hours of attachment before they transmit the disease. So do a tick check. And, and I'm here to tell you, uh, when I go out collecting bugs and come back in, I usually say, dear, uh, let's go in the bathroom and do a tick check. Uh, I can do the front of my body and, and my legs and so forth, but I can't do my backside. And, and my wife is very understanding of this. I say, okay, dear, see any ticks back there? And, and, and you know, I'm serious. Uh, you you got to do that. And, and since I do it, uh, usually within that 24-hour period of time, uh, that, that I think she's become very familiar with all my moles. I've had her, is that a, no, it's not, it's a mole. Uh, but uh, again, you're, you're probably going to need a partner <laughs> to help you out with these tick checks. Ticks are masters of reproduction. Uh, when the female, and remember it's only the female that really engorges and gets to that really large shape, her, her uh, abdomen uh, is, is basically wrinkled up uh, exoskeleton that can unwrinkle and, and expand. It, it can't blow up like a balloon. It's actually just unfolding in these little micro folds uh, that are in there. Once a tick is, is fed, uh, she'll drop off of the host animal, uh, especially if she's mated. Uh, remember that, that ticks have what we call risky life cycles, that uh, the, uh, when a female tick finds a host and engorges in blood, a male tick has to find her too on there so that they can mate. Once she's mated, she can then fertilize the eggs. She drops off, uh, usually finds a little secluded uh, crack or crevice in the ground. Uh, if she's in a building or something, she'll find a little crack or crevice on the side of the room or something like that. And about a, a week to 10 days later, she will extrude out all of these eggs. And most ticks will lay somewhere between at least 500 up to a couple of thousand eggs. Now, why do they lay that many eggs? Well, as I said, they have risky life cycles because the first instar, uh, the, the little larva, has to find a host. That's risky. You've got to go out and try to find this host. And in the meantime, you could dry up. You could uh, desiccate if you don't find that in, in a good period of time. Uh, once it feeds, it's got to drop off of that host. It's got to find a secluded place to shed its exoskeleton again. Then it's going to go find another host. And so you can imagine that, that dropping off, shedding your exoskeleton, finding another host, and then finally when you reach adulthood, you have to have both the, the male and female get together uh, and mate in order to lay eggs. They're, they're not parthenogenic. Now, with that said, uh, I don't know, did anybody see in the, the news about a week and a half ago that they've discovered a new tick on the east coast of North America? 
Nobody reads the paper anymore. Okay, uh, and, uh, but this is a tick that uh, was really uh, shocking and alarming to me because it is a parthenogenic tick. What does that mean? It means the females can produce fertile eggs without mating. Oh, wow. That, that particular species of tick has figured out a way to reduce some of the hazard of, in this case, needing a male to mate with before I can produce eggs. As I indicated earlier, the vast majority of the mites are either plant feeding mites or free living predatory mites or even detritus feeding uh, mites. Now, I've got this close up picture of the little two spotted spider mites. The spider mites are very common on various types of plants. And as you can see, the reason why we call them spider mites is that they make silk. And in this case, they actually have little silk glands up in their chelicerae. And instead of having the spinnerets like spiders do, they actually produce their silk out of their mouth parts and, and can make this very fine uh, silk webbing on their host plant material. All mites and ticks have that complicated life cycle. Uh, most of them lay eggs, but there are a few uh, mites and ticks that can give, quote, live birth. Most of them lay eggs, then they hatch out uh, into a, and this is where it gets really bizarre, they, the larva only has three pairs of legs. So why aren't they hexapods or insects? Well, they're going to turn into a mite. They're going to gain another pair of legs in the next instar. But if you look at them, they don't have any antennae. They've got chelicerate mouth parts. They've got a cephalothorax and abdomen. So they still have those other characteristics that tells us that they're a chelicerate. Some of these can be really important to us. Uh, right now, uh, you probably have heard of, of the honeybee uh, colony collapse and decline. Uh, and, and everybody seems to be trying to blame pesticides for it, but this is the number one culprit right here. It's, it's called a varroa mite, and here you can see that mite on the pupa of a honeybee. The mites themselves suck blood out of the mite larvae and pupae. And look at the size of that thing. That would be like having a parasite about that big around hooked onto the side of my body uh, and, and sucking blood out of me. And I'm here to tell you, it doesn't take very many of those to start causing some real problems in a honeybee uh, hive. And what we're finding is that uh, the other thing that, that's been fairly recently found out is that these mites are also carrying various virus diseases. So if they feed on an infected honeybee larva that has this virus disease, they can then infect a whole bunch more larvae in that colony. And, and so that, that's what's going on. It's really this, this mite and some of the diseases that uh, we believe are causing many of the uh, colony collapse problems.